Good morning. I am so glad that we're going to be able to squeak in worship before we get uh, before we get pummeled here. Let me turn this. I've been getting told that the signal is not good from that side, and that side is just five feet closer to the modem. So we're going to try it like this today. We'll see how it goes. But welcome to worship this morning. Um, the only announcement that I have, well, I have two announcements. One is you'll see the per capita amount is in the bulletin. Um, and also that uh, session is meeting after worship today. Okay. Let's approach God with our hearts ready for worship this morning. Would you join me in the call to worship? God's steadfast love extends to the heavens. God's faithfulness to the clouds. With God is the fountain of life. In God's light, we see light. May God's steadfast love be with us. May we draw closer to God. In this time of worship, May we seek the presence of Christ in one another. Would you please join me for our first hymn this morning, God of Grace and God of Glory.
confession right there. Not the one that's printed necessarily today, but let's come before God and confess the ways that we have failed, the ways that we have lost our wisdom and that we have lost our courage, um, and come to God again and ask once again for what we so desperately need, God's forgiveness and love. Would you join me in the prayer of confession? Almighty God, our rock and our salvation, we confess that our own foundation has been shaky. We have been manipulative in relationships, used friends and others for social gain. We confess that at times we tolerate the actions of others when they should be called out. Forgive us for the times we have broken boundaries and taken advantage of others. Show us how to be gentle with ourselves when we have been hurt and wronged by others. Teach us to create good foundations that build trust, respect, compassion, and mutual love. In your love and grace, may we grow in relationship with one another. Amen. Children of God, as we will hear today from the Gospel lesson, Jesus came to all humanity to redeem all of humanity from our brokenness, from our sin, so that we can be called children of God, so that we can be adopted into God's family. And that is how God truly shows us God's love. So rejoice in the good news of the Gospel. It is through Jesus Christ that we are forgiven. Amen. Would you join me in the Gloria Patri? <laughs> before we dive into the scriptures. Let's pray together. Gracious God, open our hearts to your word the same way you opened your salvation to the whole world. May you give us the wisdom to see your love in every passage of scripture. Amen. So I treated myself, this is my Christmas present to myself this year. I got a large print Bible. <laughs> because I've been noticing that I can't look up and then find my place again in the old one. My doctor's appointment, my eye appointment is at the end of the month. And I'm sure we're going to be talking bifocals. Um, but uh, that was <laughs> that's something I felt like I needed up here was bigger print to look at. So listen for God's word to you from our first reading this morning in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 62, verses 1 through 5. 
For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal tiara in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be called desolate, but you shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land shall be called married, for the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you, and as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our New Testament lesson is from the Gospel of Luke. And if you're not typically a scripture follower, this might be a good week to pull out your Bible <laughs> and follow along. Um, we're going to start reading in Luke chapter 3, verses 23 through 38. So these are the ancestors of Jesus. So read along if you can. Keep your Bible out for the sermon. <laughs> Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his work. He was the son, as was thought, of Joseph, son of Heli, son of Mathet, son of Levi, son of Melchi, son of Yanai, son of Joseph, son of Mattathias, son of Amos, son of Nahum, son of Esli, son of, Neg son of Magi, son of Maath, son of Mattathias, son of Semain, son of Joseph, son of Jodah, son of Jonan, son of Resa, son of Zerubbabel, son of Sheatiel, son of Mary, son of Melchi, son of Adi, son of Kosum, son of Elmadam, son of Ur, 
son of Joshua, son of Eliezer, son of Joram, son of Matat, son of Levi, son of Simeon, son of Judah, son of Joseph, son of Jonam, son of Eliakim, son of Melia, son of Mena, son of Matatha, son of Nathan, son of David, son of Jesse, son of Obed, son of Boaz, son of Salah, son of Nashon, son of Aminadab, son of Admin, son of Arni, son of Hezron, son of Perez, son of Judah, son of Jacob, son of Isaac, son of Abraham, son of Terah, son of Nahor, son of Serug, son of Reu, son of Peleg, son of Eber, son of Shelah, son of Canaan, son of Arphaxad, son of Shem, son of Noah, son of Lamech, son of Methuselah, son of Enoch, son of Jared, son of Mahalaleel. No, I didn't get that one right. Mahalaleel. There we go. Son of Canaan, son of Enos, son of Seth, son of Adam, son of God. Here is the reading of God's holy word for us this day. Thanks be to God. <laughs> and you can see why I wrote a large print Bible for that one. <laughs> so back in the 70s, one of the first things that Sesame Street did, that they were known for right away, um, was having celebrities come on to teach things. And that kind of got... Um, much more elaborate as the years went on, but in the first episodes, one of the first earliest episodes of Sesame Street, they had James Earl Jones on to do two things. He said the alphabet and he counted to 10. And there he takes up the whole screen in a black turtleneck, a completely shaved head, his, his broad smile and his hazel eyes looking like they could stare right through your soul. And a young James Earl Jones looks at the camera and says, One. And that, then after a long pause, long enough to digest the absolute essence of the number one, he says, Two. And on the surface, it's boring. You know, it, 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 just a guy in a turtleneck, counting to ten, saying the alphabet. And they've placed this sort of soundtrack of some city traffic behind him, very similar to the soundtrack we get here in the summer. And it's just him, in his voice, taking up the whole screen. But you have to remember what television was like before Sesame Street, right? You had Lassie, you had Mayberry, you had Leave it to Beaver, you know, all, all rural, all suburban, and all white. And here is a black man on Sesame Street in an undeniably urban neighborhood with the sounds of the city behind him teaching children to count. He was teaching them a lot more than just numbers. Teaching them an awful lot more important things than just numbers. None of us really remember the process of learning to count to ten. None of us really remember the moment or the process of learning the whole alphabet, or even how we learned how to read. This is going to sound ridiculous, but what matters is we know the math. We know how to count to 10. We know, you know how to recite the alphabet. I mean, of course we know them. But what would life be like 
if we didn't know how to count to 10, or if we didn't know all of our letters, if they were still these mysterious symbols floating on walls or floating on pieces of paper before us. I've never preached on the genealogy of Jesus before. Either one of them, there are two of them. There's one in Matthew and one in Luke. And we'll touch on both of them. The Gospel of Mark does not have time for such things. The Gospel of Mark is off and running from the very first verse. And the Gospel of John, well, he's kind of got his head on deeper, more spiritual matters. And so I want you to know two things about them that I used James Earl Jones to illustrate earlier. The genealogies are essential, believe it or not, to understand both Matthew and Luke and to understand what both of them are trying to tell us about who Jesus is. But just like the alphabet or learning to count to 10, we've taken them for granted. We skip over them. And we often don't think about them. You know, why this gospel writer would take, you know, over 10 verses, like 15 verses, in a time when writing material was really precious. It's an awful lot of ink to spill and an awful lot of column inches, as they say in the newspaper business, to take up. So why are they there? And then number two, to understand that there is more going on here than just names. Even though the reading of them is as dry as someone just looking at the screen, reciting the alphabet, or reciting, counting to ten, there is way more going on underneath the surface than we realize. So Matthew and Luke's genealogies of Jesus, first off, I'll tell you right now, they don't match. If you're looking for perfect one-to-one -one, uh, synchronization, you're not going to find it. Um, because some of them are missing some names, and it looks like, you know, maybe the other one added some names. Sometimes they don't even have the same son of that you'd think they should. For example, when we get to son of David, after that, Matthew has son of Solomon. That makes sense, because Solomon was the next king after David. But Luke has son of Nathan. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but I just wanted to use that to illustrate that they are not perfect. Like any scripture, you know, Matthew and Luke weren't sitting there at the same desk comparing their notes. They weren't on Ancestry.com looking for multiple sources. They were trying to illustrate who Jesus is and was for them. And they're trying to tell a story of the way God works. So let's look at it. We're not going to look at every single one. Relax. Um, many of the names, their significance has been lost to history. I mean, it's possible that there are stories around the campfire of each one about, you know, Jesus' great-great-grandfather, but most of the names don't have that much significance to us 2,000 years later. But we're going to focus on the ones that we, that we do know about. So Luke starts off with, Jesus was the son of Joseph, as we thought. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. So already we have a little bit of like drama being thrown here because we all know that Joseph raised Jesus, but Luke wants to get out right in the front. Jesus was the son of God. But Jewish genealogies at the time went through the men and left out a lot of the women, which is something we're going to talk about too. So you have Jesus, son of Joseph, as was thought. And then we skip down a whole bunch, blah, 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 son of Mattathias, son of Amos. So it's possible that this Amos 
could be the Amos that has that book in the Bible. That biblical prophet who has that famous verse of let justice roll down like waters. Famous because it's on Martin Luther King's grave. So Jesus could have this prophet in his lineage. This ancient voice, one of the first prophets to get their stuff written down. On how to refocus the people away from empty ceremonies and the corruption of the temple and look back toward the ways of God. So that was one that certainly would have jumped out to the folks who are reading this gospel. And then we travel down, verse 31. Do, 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 do. Verse 31. There we go. This is where we get at the end of the verse, son of David. <clears throat> son of David, son of Nathan, son of David, son of Jesse. So I think we feel maybe like we're on firmer ground here, both in terms of pronounceability of these names and also in terms of these are names we recognize. We sing sometimes that hymn at Christmas about the Messiah springing like a green shoot from the stump of Jesse. And there he is, Jesus, descending from Jesse through David through Nathan. Nathan, not Solomon. Nathan is actually David's third son in line. So he's not the big guy. He's not the big king, full of wisdom. But what we don't hear in this genealogy, but what would have really jumped out to folks reading this, is who Nathan's mother was. Nathan's mother was Bathsheba. You remember Bathsheba? This is like... This is like your entire Old Testament 101 in one chapter of scripture here. Bathsheba comes into David's life as part of one of the most sinful acts David ever commits. He sees Bathsheba, this married woman. He wants Bathsheba, and so he takes Bathsheba. And if this doesn't sound consensual, it shouldn't. And then when she gets pregnant with their first child, David plots to have her husband move to the front of the lines of battle. His name was Uriah, the Hittite. David plots to kind of cover up this conspiracy by moving her husband to the front lines of battle where he inevitably dies. Leaving David to marry Bathsheba as a way to cover up his ungodly behavior. Jesus' ancestor, Nathan, may not be the one who got to be king after Solomon, but Nathan is the one who was named after the prophet who had the guts to go into David and call David out for all of his sin, to bring David into repentance and to bring him back into God's way of doing things. And then David, as an act of repentance, names one of his children after the prophet Nathan. And that's who Jesus' ancestor is. And then hidden in verse 32, really tiny, son of Jesse, son of Obed, son of Boaz. That one might fly right past you. Because it doesn't mention who Boaz's wife was. Boaz's wife was Ruth, who also has a book of her own, Ruth the Moabite. This is one of the most well-known instances of a Jewish person in Jesus' line marrying a foreigner. This is starting to sound a little bit more like daytime TV than scripture. Because Jewish people didn't easily or lightly marry outside of the Jewish community at that time. And so it's really notable. She gets her whole a, a, a book of her own to talk about that story. 
And Ruth and Boaz's relationship in that book in the Old Testament is marked by this very this word that will become very important to the New Testament. We call it loving kindness. It's it's not going to be easy to pronounce wearing a mask, but it's it's hesed, which is this Hebrew word for this unconditional love that they have for each other, this sort of love that conquers boundaries and love that breaks down walls. And they have this love not just for each other, but for Ruth's mother, Naomi. And we see that loving kindness reflected so much in Jesus' ministry. And as it moves, as that word moves through the New Testament, it ends up being translated as grace. That unconditional love, the grace of God, the grace of Christ, gets its root in the hesed, in the loving kindness of this couple. So then we keep going and we read about the 12 sons of Jacob. Jesus is, we finally learn that Jesus is descended from the line of Judah. And how, there it is. Son of Hezron, son of Perez, son of Judah, son of Jacob, Isaac, Abraham. So now we're into, again, we're kind of into territory in the Old Testament that we feel like we're, we know about, we're okay. However, we don't talk a lot about how Jesus' ancestor, Judah's son, Perez, was born. Because this is another story that could be right out of Maury Povich or Jerry Springer. Perez's mother was Judah's daughter-in-law. She dressed up as a lady of the evening, shall we say, and seduced Judah into her bed. And when she got pregnant, the family was going to burn her to death because she's supposed to be a widow, so what are you doing having a baby? And they were going to burn her at the stake. But that night, Judah had given her his signet ring. You know, like that, that ring with the family crest on it with his own personal seal and symbol. And so right at the last moment, she pulls it out and says, like, Judah, you are the father, which saves her from being burned at the stake. So it's a big old mess. You should really check out. It's Genesis 38 if you really want your hair blown back. But that's on Jesus' family tree. All of this stuff is on Jesus' family tree. So, son of Jacob, son of Isaac, son of Abraham. And this, we mentioned the genealogy of Matthew. This is where the genealogy of Matthew stops. Well, really, this is where it starts, because Matthew starts with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and, and moves down to get to Jesus. <clears throat> and Luke starts at Jesus and then moves backwards through time. But Matthew starts with Abraham. Matthew doesn't go any further back because Matthew's gospel, we find out, we, this is one of the ways that we learn that it's written for a Jewish audience. And it was important to Matthew to prove to the community that Jesus descended from the founders of the covenant people and that you can trace Jesus all the way back to the original covenant that God made with Abraham. Jesus is part of that covenantal family. It's, it's very important that Matthew communicates that to his audience. But Luke keeps going. Luke keeps on trucking. He goes through Noah's son, Shem, Noah, Methuselah, the oldest person in the Bible. And finally, we get a few more generations. And finally, we go through Seth who's the third child of Adam and Eve. Remember what happened with Cain and Abel? That didn't end up well. So finally through Seth, Adam, and then the Son of God. While Matthew was writing to a Jewish audience, Luke was writing to an audience that wasn't Jewish. He was traveling around with Paul. That's how we get his other book, the book of Acts. And so he was being exposed to all of these other cultures, Greek and, and Roman and, you know, 
Ephesus and all of these cities in the, in the country that's now modern-day Turkey. And so when Luke was writing, he was thinking more of those folks, those who did not grow up hearing that they were child, children of the covenant every week. And Luke wants them to understand that Jesus came through the covenant of Abraham, but he came for all of humanity. Came for us. Not just for Abraham's descendants, but all of us, universally, globally. The kingdom of God is not limited to the geographical borders of Palestine, but the kingdom of God is as far as the east is from the west, and the kingdom of God is for every tongue and every tribe and every nation. The kingdom of God is meant to include all of us. Adam is the representative of the whole human race. Son of Adam, son of God. Jesus is the savior of the world. He came for everyone. All the way from the first son of God, Adam, through all of that mess, to the next son of God, <clears throat> the new Adam. <coughs> Excuse me. What, what we read in those 15 verses is a list of names. One, two, three. But what we are actually seeing is all of these things that Jesus comes to embody. And that he did it in a very specific time, in a very specific place, with some very human ancestors that needed God's redemption and showed that through their lives, or who preached about reform. In, re in religious practice and what it really means to follow God. He had some very human ancestors. But at the same time that we see in Jesus, that we see God working through and preaching in a specific time and place, Jesus is using the tools of our messy humanity, which you can, I just went through them all, and he's using those tools in order to save the entire world. There are some glowing examples of righteousness and faith in Jesus' lineage. Some we know well, and others that are more hidden, that are a little more lost in time. Some of the brief verses about Noah's father, Lamech, are really, you know, they're just brief little snippets into what a follower of God he was. But most of that is lost. <coughs> but what this lineage, lineage really is, over and over and over again, is a story of God redeeming our brokenness. God took generations of mistakes and generations of falling and getting back up again. He took generations of huge mistakes and pain and hurt and manipulation and corruption. <clears throat> and out of them, God produces the one who would redeem all of us from our pain and from our hurt and from our brokenness and from our manipulation and corruption. This genealogy is not just a list of names. It is the story of who we are. It's the story of how much we need God. And it's the story of how God goes about providing that person that we need. Born in a specific place, in a specific time, and yet somehow 
able to redeem the entire world. Which is pretty cool from a list of names. So we made it. Thanks be to God. <laughs> our hymn, if you uh, would be willing to stand for our hymn, In Christ There Is No East or West. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Hold on one second. I retyped this after Christmas, and it's taken me two weeks to see some of the mistakes I made. Okay. One of the things about being connected to God is that our prayer life can be pretty free. I think that that, that is one of the things that we take for granted is how not the same our prayers can be from week to week, how not rigid our prayers need to be, that they, you know, that we can just come to God. Um, and I am so grateful for that this morning. So would you join me uh, as we approach God with all of our prayers and all of, all of our concerns? Let's pray together. God, you can be such a mystery to us. You can be such a mystery in the way that you work, in the way that 
Time does not always seem to progress. And sometimes we turn back, but sometimes we loop around and the, the, the line from A to B is never straight. The line of following you is never as straight as a genealogy that just goes from one generation to another. Remind us that as Jesus has troubling branches on his family tree and also wonderfully righteous people on his family tree, family tree. Remind us that it's also like that with our lives. But there are times whenever we don't feel like we are vibrant, when we don't feel like we are strong vines or strong branches. And that there are times that we really do feel like we are. That we feel like we're contributing, that we feel like we are passing on your love. Remind us that all things are seasons with you, and that it is your presence that goes with us, and your hand that shapes us, that is what's important. As we prepare for the events of this week, as we prepare for huge amounts of snow, as we prepare for events in our, in our families and in our lives. God, we ask that you be with us. We especially ask your blessing on those who are incredibly vulnerable for the next three days. God, we pray that warmth may somehow find its way to them. We pray that help may somehow find its way to them. God, we pray that you would make yourself known in our lives and the lives of others. We pray for those who are sitting in our hearts as individuals. We pray for their needs. We give thanks for the joy that we have seen in their lives. And God, we offer them into your care and into your hands. So that your kingdom may come and your will might be worked in this world. God, we are grateful, finally, for your son, Jesus. We're grateful that his, just like with most of us, if you dig deep into his history, you will definitely find humanity. And we are so thankful that we can use that to understand how human he was, as much as how, how much he is your son. So we pray these things and lift them all up, trusting that his spirit will bring them to your ears as sweet, sweet prayers. We pray them in his name with the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we turn to responding to God's word, let's receive the morning offering, fully understanding that God's kingdom is for all of us. So let's celebrate that this morning as we receive the, as we give of ourselves and as we receive the morning offering. Mm -hmm.
all of us. May we also be as open in proclaiming your kingdom and in sharing your blessings with the whole world. We ask that you bless these offerings so that we may do just that, so that we may be open, so that we may be loving and joyful to those around us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final hymn is The Church is One Foundation. the blessing of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.
Thank you guys for joining us today. It's good to see all of you online. <laughs>